Welcome to every album in a row from Thunder Underground. My name is Trent. I'm joined by Jason, and this is our series where we basically listen to uh, pick an artist and listen to every album in a row. It's that simple. That's right. Uh, we got Guns N' Roses this time around. Yeah. Your favorite band of all time, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, the first episode we did was Metallica, your favorite band. Okay. Then we knocked out some Megadeth. Now we're here with Guns N' Roses. The rules are pretty simple. Studio albums only. No live albums. Yep. No greatest hits albums. We'll do compilations if they're B-sides or covers or anything like that. But just as long as it's a studio album, Guns N' Roses has six of them. Yeah, and we just kind of, you know, we listen to them chronologically in a row, like you said, on our own time, separate. And then we come together and kind of talk about, you know, what we thought and about the progression and, you know, anything new that kind of popped up to us when you listen to them this way, just bam, 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 you know, a whole catalog, you know, because, you know, you might think something different or get a different idea. And that's what we're here to do and just talk about it. Yeah, see how this stuff flows together, if there's any kind of flow. Because, yeah. you know, we talked about it with Megadeth. They had, like, a cool kind of progression in the way they changed over time and kind of went down and back up and all this. And Guns N' Roses is a little shorter span, but there's obviously some differences in what was going on even early on. So yeah. let's just get into it. Appetite for Destruction. What can you say? That's one of the best mm -hmm. albums ever that exists ever in history. It's my favorite album of all time. Yeah. So listening to this, going through it, it was just like, almost like zoned out at a couple of times because I've listened to this a billion times mm -hmm. in my life. Not saying that's a bad thing, but, and I like this. I've always loved Guns N' Roses so much that I'm not even tired of Sweet Child of Mine, even though I've heard it 47,000 times yeah. between listening to it on my own and hearing it on a radio or whatever. So... I mean, really, I don't know what we need to say about it. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's, it's the absolute definition of the word classic. It really is. I mean, was it ninety percent of the song is, or uh, excuse me, ninety percent of the album is still played on the radio? Yeah. I mean, every song is etched in our brains, and for good reason. I mean, it's just raw and nasty and mean and loud but at the same time it's catchy and it's tuneful i mean there there you can't you can't recreate what they've captured on this album they can't you can't i can't no one can this album is a fucking anomaly it really is and he even uh what's the name mike clink talked about that many times I've seen interviews and stuff where he talked about how he would produce a band in there. Like, what did Slash use on Appetite for Destruction? He's like, well, this is what he used, but good luck. You know? <laughs> and they and the guys would plug in and plug into the exact same, you yeah. know, amps, whatever. And, of course, it doesn't sound the same. Yeah. No matter yeah. how hard you try. It, it's, it's, it's a true case of lightning in a bottle. Yeah. It really is. And, the, you know, I brought this up before when we were talking about Guns N' Roses. It still just, like, baffles my mind that this is one of the greatest just raw hard rock records ever. Mm -hmm. The greatest, in my opinion. And Izzy Stradlin, all his rhythm guitar parts are all first takes. Yeah. Which is just unbelievable. Again, it's just magic. It's yeah. magic. And like Slash talked about that, that he actually made a few more takes. And every time that he did it, he's like, no, nah, let me do that again. And they would just, after he left the room, they would just scrap everything yeah, after they, the first one. <laughs> a humor room. Yeah. yeah. Which is just unbelievable. And that goes to show that guy is just oozes rock and roll. Yeah, definitely. And how much he was important to this band, writing-wise and playing-wise. And I mean, you even, he's, he's on half their catalog, even though he left pretty early on because mm -hmm. he was on both the illusions as well. And I don't know one thing, you know, I was, cause when I was listening to appetite this time, since we were doing this, I tried to like think about things since we're talking about this stuff all in a row and how the stuff flowed and everything. And 
I thought that one thing that I always thought was Sweet Child of Mine kind of separates itself from the rest of those songs mm-hmm. where it's just this kind of classic love, mid-tempo love rock song where everything else just has attitude and shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's still, you can't really imagine that album without it at the same yeah, time yeah, now because it's ingrained in it. Yeah. But the other thing was Don't Cry was the supposedly the first song they ever wrote. Really? As a band. Wow. And they didn't put it on there because they said it didn't fit. Yeah. Which, hearing it, it doesn't really. I see that. Yeah, definitely. So that's kind of, you know, cool that they could see that at the time. and Recognize that. Yeah, and held it. That's smart. And another thing that I kind of thought about, which I don't think I ever really thought about before this time, was when I'm listening to Think About You, which is like the the track that kind of gets lost, I think, Mm -hmm. out of if any of them does. It's like the... The twelfth most popular track, probably. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just like every other song. It's great, but it. I thought it was really cool how all the lyrics are just like this happy-go-lucky love ballad kind of thing, but the music is still just like raw. Fuck mm. you, like anything, <laughs> yeah. like anything goes, or you're crazy. It's still got a total attitude to it, but the lyrics are totally opposite of that. Yeah, you know? definitely. But other than that, I mean. You mentioned with Metallica's Black Album, you thought the the last three songs were the best three songs to ever finish an album. I might say that the first three songs on this could be the best three songs to ever start an album. You think so? Possibly. <laughs> Welcome to the Jungle, It's So Easy, and Night Train. I mean, that's hard to beat. Yeah. Tough to beat. I think Night Train is my favorite song of all time. Really? And Welcome to the Jungle, Just Winnette. The first time you, I mean, can you remember the first time you hear it? The yeah. first time you hear that, and even now, it's still just the way it opens. It's just like the perfect opening to an mm-hmm. album, to an introduction to a band, to anything, yeah. you know? I remember I was, in, I was in the garage, the house I grew up in. I was in the garage listening to the radio, and I was like, what the fuck is this? I'm going to hell already. <laughs> you know, what, you're like 11, you know, whatever it was. That came out in 87, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <sighs> Jesus, yeah, I, th- I thought evil was upon me. It was great. <laughs> well, whenever uh, this ends, the next thing that picks up is the beginning of Lies, mm-hmm. which isn't really consistent into what we're talking about here, which is listening to how something progresses because the first four tracks on Lies were the Live Like a Suicide EP, mm-hmm. which if you're not familiar, Guns N' Roses released this EP before Appetite. Yeah. And it was basically, locally, it was the only place you could get it because they didn't, it was before the album came out. They had already signed the deal. And I think supposedly the story is Geffen backed him in putting this out. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they still, re, you know, did it real limited, you know, sold it at shows and everything. It's a collector's item now, obviously, if you have one of the original ones. And it wasn't really live. It was... Mm-hmm. Record. They recorded the four songs live in the studio, and added and then, all the fucking. Crowd then added shit. the crowd noise. So that's never happened ever right. in the history of rock and roll. Right. So it's technically live, but mm-hmm. it's not you know live in the sense of it's in front of a thousand people. Or anything. Yeah, yeah. But, but you know, and on the, on the other side of that, you get patience and some you know other acoustic stuff. So, well, the. Yeah, I mean, the, those first four songs still show how raw they were early oh, on. yeah, definitely. Even though two of them are covers. Yeah. You know, Reckless Life, you know, I wish they would record that now with, you know, the lineup they got now. Yeah, yeah. Make a, you know, an actual version of it. Yeah. But Nice Boys, you know, I've seen them do that live before. It's great, you know. And, of course, Mama Ken's amazing. Yeah. But, yeah, like you said, these four acoustic tracks, the cool thing about those are that it's four songs that are all totally different. From each other in style, subject, all that. That's right. You've got yeah. like a love ballad. You've got kind of like a jokey Music, kind yeah. of thing. And yeah. then you've got like one. Well, then you've got an acoustic version of you're, you're crazy. crazy. And then you've got one in a million. One in a million. You can just offend everybody. Right. And, you know, you can't fucking do that today. <laughs> I don't know why you'd want to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they put that out in 1989 and. Of course, everybody was up in arms, but it was still during a period where you could, there could be controversy, and then it would just blow over a little bit later. Yeah, and exactly. Helps you sell another million albums, you know. 
<laughs> That's right. It's a great song, though, regardless. Well, going into moving right into Use Your Illusion 1 mm-hmm. in 1991, the very first track, the thing I noticed from doing this is Right Next Door to Hell fits perfectly. It does. With it, appetite. It, it does, and it's... And I notice, you know, when I go back and listen to stuff over the Use Your Illusion 1 and 2, a lot of stuff fits with appetite. Yeah. But a lot of stuff doesn't. And I was... It's just so crazy to see how you listen to... And this, you know, this right here is why we're doing this. This little series of listening to things in a row. You take, you know, Appetite for Destruction and Lies and then... Just a couple short years later, they've already graduated to this epic, grand Use Your Illusion 1 and 2. I mean, that's like, that's something that a band, like, I could see the same band doing that like 10 years later. Yeah. And they just said, fuck, we're going to just go big now. And I just, it, it was, and you know, that really. They're like in their mid 20s, yeah. Like, yeah, it's like, it's just so crazy. And, um, and it's just they—they they just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, which I think ultimately led to, you know, their deflation a few years later, because they got so big so fast off these albums. And my question to you, you know, I hope I'm not jumping around too much, but is you know, is your favorite band? I mean, do you think they should have done two albums? I mean, here's first of all, weren't they both released at the same time? Yeah. One and two. Okay. Do you think they should have maybe waited, put some space in between them, or just put out one album, you know? Or do you like that they just came out swinging and got mega, mega huge just right off the bat? Yeah, I don't know if if they have, say, put out number two like a year later Mm -hmm. or something, if that would have done anything different because they would have already been... Because they went straight into you know, arenas at that point. Yes. They were already, I think they were already in arenas with, you know, towards the end of the appetite cycle. Yeah. Cause they were, they were opening up for like Aerosmith and Rolling Stones and all mm-hmm. these bands and then went on and did their own stuff. And once they started doing illusion stuff and just got big and then they, that just went from arenas doing outdoor stadiums, you know, and all kinds of stuff for that next like three years or two and a half years. I don't know if delaying the album would have changed anything because it would have just been in the middle of that whole cycle. Yeah, true. Because it was so, it was just so huge. I can't, I can't remember. I should have looked up what the first. I think you was you could be mine, the first single. See, I want. I feel like that's because it came out a little beforehand on yeah. the Terminator Two soundtrack. Yep. And I mean that was already massive when this was coming out, and. See, yeah, I should have looked that up. I don't know what the the order of the singles or anything, but yeah, I still remember they came out the, the same day, and you know I was like fourteen, I think, and I only had enough money to get one of them. <laughs> so Mike Thrash's brother Kevin, you know, was older than us and out of school when he was going to pick him up that day. So me and Thrasher both gave him you know, some money to pick up for us, you know, pick up one for us. And I could only get one. So I said, get number two, because I like blue better than red. (laughs) And I just want to be different. Get the second one first. Yeah. I don't remember which one Thrasher got, but. I got the second one first. Yeah. I don't know why, but I just, and to to this day, that's my favorite of the two. And it's probably just because of that. They're, they're both equally great yeah i used to always say that when anyone would ask way back then two was my favorite and but i don't know you know the more i you know that i've listened to one a few times over the last few years Mm -hmm. and oh man i don't i don't know bad obsession that's one of the best fucking songs ever in the world it could be better maybe yeah i mean double talk and jive fucking perfect crime God damn it, it's a perfect crime. I mean, <laughs> I, I love this record. Yeah, when we were talking about uh, Right Next Door to Hell, 
Yeah. Um, being something that would fit on appetite. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned other stuff like you could be mine. Obviously was always one of those ones yeah. that fit perfectly in the appetite or, you know, perfect crime was another one, you know, maybe back off bitch a little bit. Yeah. And then of course, uh, you know, shotgun blues maybe. Yeah. But, you know, it, it has its songs because that's the one thing I, you always hear people knocking. You know, the, the people that don't like it, which I know, I think it's a minority, but over the last several years, I'll always see someone saying, you know, they had one good album or whatever. And then I'll see people say what people said about Load and Reload. There should have been one album. They could have. But to me, there's there's only two or three songs maybe that I would have got rid of. Yeah. So I couldn't even combine yeah. it into one I, album. I'm I such get, a fanboy. too. Such a fanboy, I couldn't combine it into one album, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And, you know, what's funny is uh, just a, a personal, you know, humorous note. Uh, I don't know. A year or two ago, I pulled out Use Your Illusion 2. Hadn't listened to it in years. Literally years. And Get In The Ring came on, and I fucking knew every fucking word of his little fucking rap in yeah. the middle <laughs> about, you know, fuck know. you, Andy Sesher, Hip Parader. I fucking wall it, crane. yeah. I never it, time never lapsed. I knew every fucking word of it, <laughs> you know, because I had just yeah. etched it in my brain so much as a kid. You know what? This podcast, <clears throat> this podcast gets more pussy than Bob Gushiani. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, shit. <laughs> well, I forgot what I was gonna say here. Oh yeah, Dustin Bones. I wanted to mention because that's like that's the second track. If you say you got these things when they came out, or when you're listening to it now, in order, the second track you come to and right out the gate of these two grand albums, it's the first album that features someone else's vocals. Yeah, and and, and I, I I like when they did that. I like when bands do that. You know. Yeah. I kind of get a kick out of that. Yeah, and especially because you know the besides Axel, the people that were featured on occasion were Izzy and then Duff. And they all three have significantly different voices, mm-hmm. which is great. You know, Izzy's got that stonesy kind of 70s raw thing, and Duff's got that 70s kind of punk thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it all works for the stuff that they did it with. And, you know, jumping on to two again, 14 years with Izzy singing and Axel is, you know, one of my favorite Guns N' Roses oh, songs. Oh, yeah, it's so good. And then, I agree. But then on on one, you got that combination of the garden with Alice Cooper, Dead Horse, and Coma. Like these three songs alone, yeah, make this album unbelievable. Yeah, they do. Like Coma is just like ten minutes of amazingness, and like whenever I saw them this past year in Dallas and Houston, they're playing it live. You know, these days it's just it's still unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Well, what do you think? I mean, do you think when you go from one, what we're doing here, the Ariel Monroe, when you go from one to two, does it just flow to you as like one big long thing? Yeah, when I when I listen to it, and you know, I I, I seems like I remember doing this before a long time ago, listening to both together, and it it, it really, you know, when you when you kind of you got to take, you know, your 15 year old self aside and yeah. sit him down and tell him to calm down because you know all he wants to do is listen to use your illusion too all he wants to do is listen to get in the ring like 50 times over <laughs> when you, you you listen to these two in a row I mean it's just it's one big thing you could have any song on any, any album yeah I mean it, it's just it's a great big statement yeah definitely yeah I think I think when you listen to them in a you know together, it's perfect. But if like say number two was the only one that existed, mm-hmm. it would be weird if Civil War was the first song, like it is. Yeah, because to me it it does it doesn't really sound like an album opener, and when you compare it to you know a normal rock album at least, but mm-hmm. when you just listen to it after one, it just keeps on flowing. You know? Yeah, yep, and. uh what was the other thing I want to mention? Breakdown is a song that most people don't ever talk about. And that's just like, that's one that jumps out as being completely different from what they were doing. Cause it's just like this total classic rock kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. I, I want to say something going back to like civil war. I really love Duff's bass tone in that, you know, 
he's picking and he's th- his base is just like this shimmery. I, I hear that a lot in the Use Your Illusions and I don't know. I just want to mention that. Yeah. It's just a really cool, a really cool bass sound. Yeah. I always like that. Yeah, the locomotive on number two is one of my top five Guns N' Roses songs. Yeah. And pretty tied up, of course. That's another one that would have fit on Appetite. Cool ranch dressing. <laughs> what can you say? That's all right. Well, when you get to the end of uh, Illusion, your favorite track, is that My World, probably? No. No? Okay. No, it's not. It's not. That goes on songs that they could have left in the... Lars's dad said, I would have hit delete. <laughs> right. So, yeah, there you go. Yeah, you remember that was always the thing, like, later, once they started... Like, guys started quitting. There was always those things you'd read in magazines, like, it's because Axel... You wants know, to go industrial or whatever yeah, the and fuck. It, yeah. You know, and the, the tone of my world is what he wants the whole album to be like, which yeah. obviously wasn't true. I mean, you well, hear... you know, you hear who into, cares? It was a minute and 20 seconds long. Who gives a fuck? Yeah. He can do whatever he wants. Yeah. It's Play like, a fucking kazoo for all I care. Well, they did later on in Human Being. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um... Yeah, like you said, it's a minute and 20 seconds on a, two albums together that are how long when you combine them? Yeah. I don't know, three For hours. so many great songs. And, yeah, and there's several songs that are nine plus minutes, like Estrange, November Rain, mm. and Locomotive, Coma and, and Coma. Yeah, here's one song that's a minute and 20 seconds that's fucking weird. Who gives a shit? Yeah, get over it. <laughs> well. I agree. Jumping... I guess out of the illusions. Yeah. Hey, I saw him live during that period. It was badass. Oh, I bet. I can only imagine. Which, going way back, one of our first episodes we ever did of our podcast was episode four or five, where we just talked about Guns N' Roses with Mike Thrasher, our friend that I mentioned earlier, because mm-hmm. that was always his favorite band as well growing up. And we just told stories about that concert and all our memories of. Loving these guys when we were young and everything. Yeah, it's a great one. Well, the next album, two years later, was the Spaghetti Incident. Full covers album. Yeah, I. this is where it gets fun for me. I really, I listened to this album a lot. I really enjoyed it. I thought they did some great covers. Um, it opened me up to some bands I'd never heard of. Um, I, re- I really dug it. Really did. Yeah, when this, you know, the... You mentioned it and open up to bands you never heard of, and you've mentioned that before on podcasts, like when we were younger and you get to that period where you get a little burned out and then you kinda of go back and check yeah, out definitely. check out the bands that Metallica loved or yeah. whoever. Well Guns N' Roses did a good job of covering there's no one really hugely mainstream on this as mm-hmm. far as mega there's yeah. mega icons on here like Iggy Pop or whatever, but there's no no one Nobody that was, that was huge. like mainstream. Yeah, there's huge no, mainstream. There's no fucking journeys or Led Zeppelins <laughs> or whatever the fuck, you know. Right. Yeah. So when you're when you hear this when you're 16 and you haven't delved into all that a whole lot, you do get opened up to a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's cool to hear him do an Iggy song. It's cool to hear him sing with Michael Monroe. It's cool to, you know, uh, it's it's you know it's great to hear a song like I don't care about you. I mean, yeah. it's great. Well, see, I thought it was cool with. Okay, the first song is from the 50s. Yeah. Then the whole rest of the album is 70s era, you know, punk rock, 70s glam, yeah. garage rock, all that stuff. And then just out of the blue, here comes Soundgarden. Yeah, which, I know. Which I always thought even yeah. way back then was as badass. The ballsy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it was just kind of cool, you know, you mix T-Rex and Soundgarden together, which whoever... Like how, you know, Axel or whoever's sitting around and thinks, let's mix T-Rex and Soundgarden together. And it just mm-hmm. works perfect, you know? Yeah. Yep. I mean, for me, you know, I, I loved Attitude. I thought that was fun. Yeah. Uh, Down on the Farm was badass. And, you know, like I said, I don't care about you. I mean, I fucking, I love that song. I want to start a band just to do that song. Right. You know, and be it like, and have it be the first song of our set. <laughs> I mean, that's just how good and like the energy they put into that. I mean, it's just, I want to be that song. I don't care about you. Fuck you. That's <laughs> awesome. Leaving, baby. Yep. <laughs> well, you mentioned Down on the Farm way back then. That was 
my favorite song on the album. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's still there's not really, but um, a thing that jumped out at me when I'm listening to it this time is that Human Being really sounds like a Guns N' Roses song. Yeah. It sounds like something that would have just been on Use Your Illusion. You and know? who did that originally? I'm sorry. It escapes me. That was... Uh, Oh man, was that the one? That, is that the Dead Boys? Oh, I got you. I guess I got you. I know all the bands that are on it, but a couple of them I get confused on which song they are. <laughs> that yeah. might be the Dead Boys, but I'm probably wrong too. Well, the other thing that I thought was cool was that every sing, you know, besides just saying that sounds like a song that could have been written by Guns N' Roses. Yeah, all these. Pretty much all 12 songs just sound like Guns N' Roses. Yeah, they do. They really do. It, this is this is a great, you know, this is a great kind of thing saying, hey, here's where we came from. Yeah. You know, mix all this up and here, this is, and this is us, you know. Yeah, and they stuck, you know, to all the more, like we said, the more lesser known stuff. Because everybody mm-hmm. knows these guys were huge Aerosmith and Stones guys, but they yeah. left that out because they'd already done... A million of those fucking songs. They've done Aerosmith, you know, on Lies and... Yep. You know, and they did the bigger stuff like Bob Dylan and Paul McCartney on The Illusions. And then, of course, we'll get to Stones here in a bit. But, uh... I was just trying to look up who sang Human Beings while I was stalling. (laughs) (laughs) It's all right, man. It's all right. (laughs) Well, mention Live and Let Die. That might be my favorite cover of theirs yeah overall just because it's so i mean that's already a song that everybody knows because it's just this classic classic rock song yeah and they took it to a whole nother level you know no disrespect to paul mccartney one of the greatest musicians of all time but guns is my favorite band and i think their version is better yeah there you go probably is (laughs) i know you're not a beatles guy so you can say that yeah (laughs) Hopefully Josh Baker will hear this. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, I, after I don't care about you, we got the the Charles Manson song. Look at your game, girl. That is a dumb song. Yeah. I don't care who wrote it. It sounds stupid. It's yeah. like some beatnik sixties bullshit. Skip. Yeah. That's what it was. Keep beatnik going. 60s yeah. Bullshit. Keep going. <laughs> Fuck hey. Charlie Manson. Whatever. Axel was just. Just doing it for the controversy, yeah, whether he said it to piss people off, whether he said he was or not, because they turned around and donated like uh, profits from any sales of that to uh, one of the foundations for like you know one of the mm-hmm. the families and one Take, of the victims, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, after lies in between, or well, basically the last thing that the band recorded for several years and released was "Sympathy for the Devil." Mm-hmm. Which was on the interview with the interview with the vampire soundtrack, mm-hmm. and I always loved it. You know, I don't know what other people's opinions oh, are. I thought it was it. It was yeah. an all right cover. It was an all yeah. right version. That song, you know, by this point now, twenty years later, has been covered a little too many times. Yes, but what well, wasn't uh, wasn't this the first one they did without Slash? Yeah, yeah. But the the thing is, I think. Don't quote me on this, but I think he's credited on it. Okay. And he said in his book, he might not be credited, but I think he was, because when it came out, no one knew that it wasn't he wasn't on it. And then he talked about that in his book and said that he actually recorded the you know parts for it. And then I guess after he left or whatever, or around that same time, whenever before he'd officially left or whatever, Axel just scrapped all his stuff and had. Um, Paul Tobias, is that right? You're the guy yeah. when it comes to GNR. I don't yeah. know, man. That was the dude he, or Chris, no, that Chris dude was there. But that's the dude he brought in and had him re-record the parts. So it wasn't even, I don't know if Gilby even recorded parts and then those were scrapped too or what. But So basically it was like, I think it was Axel, Duff, Matt, okay. and then Paul Tobias or whoever. Yeah. Well, but it, I, you it, know, was an all right, it was an all right version. You know, yeah, I liked it. And I mean, it's probably, the one, yeah, it was one of the bigger covers. The only, you know, I take that back. You know, we just said that about Spaghetti Incident. Hair of the Dog was actually a huge hit. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, one of the, the only song on there, I think, that was like a huge radio thing. Yeah. But it's a perfect song for them to cover because, you know, Nazareth, I mean, who are we kidding, you know? That's one of the bands that they kind of derive yeah. from, I think. Yeah. And Axel can pull that off, you know? Yeah. Well, now we get to about, well, five years later, the end of Day's soundtrack okay, came yeah. out. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> And this is the first song we got of the new era. Yes. With all new people. The only person left was Dizzy Reed. And I don't even know if he's on this because yeah. you don't really hear any fucking piano. <laughs> yeah, no shit. If, and anytime there was like keyboard or effect stuff, that was Axel, I think. But this song is like heavily, it's not industrial, but it's heavily distorted mm-hmm. and kind of leans that kind of like Marilyn Manson would be if not industrial, but kind of gets thrown into that category. The same way this could be, I guess. It's it's not a bad song, but it's sure as hell not anywhere near a great song. They won't be playing it <laughs> live anytime soon. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, even if they re-recorded it, it's not, not the type of song they'd probably want to redo anyway. Yeah. Yeah, true. But then we got nine years later. Yes. Here which, we are. So when you look at it, it was actually... 17 years after the last new album of original music. It's a record. Here we are in 2008, Chinese Democracy come out. Yeah. So when you're talking about every album in a row flowing together, this obviously is where stuff started changing. Yeah. Well, it did anyway with, oh my God, but Chinese Democracy itself, the song, the first song, isn't really that far off kilter Mm -hmm. as far as sounding like something different like my world or oh my god yeah the second song maybe shackler's revenge that one's a little you know got a lot of that weird shit going on yeah but i mean as a whole i'll say i i, I bought this thing the day it came out at best buy because that's the only place you could buy it yeah yeah because i'm a geek it's my favorite yeah. band i was gonna of do of course it yeah you know, even though, sure, it wasn't, no one was left except Dizzy and Axel. But, hey, I didn't care. You know, I bought all Slash's stuff. I bought everything Duff had put yeah, out in those definitely. past 15 I, years. I would have been the same way for my yeah. favorite band. Yeah, for sure. I mean, sure, it's the it's just the name there. It's basically an Axel solo album. But, hey, he owns the name. We, yeah. You know, you can't say, people say it shouldn't have been called Guns N' Roses. Well, should have not United Abominations been called Megadeth. Yeah. There was one guy in the band. Yeah. Dave Elfson wasn't even there. Yeah. Well, it's the same scenario. Yeah. And, and, uh, I kind of like what you said. It's basically an Axel solo album. That's kind of what I got from it. Not saying that in a bad way, because there's some, and by the way, today, when I finished it up, first time I'd ever listened to this record. I was going to ask you. First time ever. I've never, ever listened to this record except for this. Because I know that you had, you know, kind of made comments or talked shit before, but I always thought, I don't think he's ever even listened to this No, thing. I just like to <laughs> fuck with you. Yeah. But I, I really, I really enjoyed Chinese Democracy. Um, I, I liked Scraped. I thought Catcher in the Rye was cool. Uh, Riyadh and the Bedouins, I thought was really cool. I liked IRS. And, and, you know, it was great. Like you said, it didn't really feel like Guns N' Roses to me. It felt like you said an Axel Solo record. Um, he's kind of doing some different things with his voice. I kind of, this is maybe weird, you know, but every now and then I kind of felt like I was, there's just some Jeff Tate tinges in there somewhere. Like that mid, when he gets yeah. in that mid range, he kind of sounds like, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm crazy. But, but I mean, I, that was just kind of the first things that caught me about this album. But, you know, th- there are some memorable songs on this record. Yeah, my favorite song on this album is There Was a Time. It sounds like something that would have been on Use Your Illusion. Yeah. If you plug Slash's guitar solo onto that thing, it could easily been, mm-hmm. you know, right before Strange or something. Yeah, yeah. And it's a great song. And there's two or three other songs that are kind of the same way. Street of Dreams sounds like Guns N' Roses to me. Yeah, yeah, I get that. And kind of that piano epic kind of thing. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing I thought was crazy, too, is I was wait- I was waiting for the big 11-minute opus that's always on their albums. Yeah. And I think the longest song on this album was like six minutes long. Yeah. You know? 
Yeah, there's two. That was kind of crazy. I mean, that's cool, whatever, you know. Yeah, there's two or three of those those six minute long songs, but yeah, there wasn't anything that that went that route. I I I like that. Axel kept it lean, you know. That's cool. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I I enjoyed the record more than I thought I did. I really did. I'll tell you. That's cool to hear. Yeah. (laughs) Well, whenever I you know on this (laughs) this tour they're doing now this. It's been going on for the past almost year now. You know, I saw them twice on it last year, and they played five of the songs off of this. Well, I and like that. I think that's cool that, you know, the, the old Slash and Duff are open to that. Yeah, it's, you know, a lot of people were bitching about it, but I don't, you know, I don't really no, see any they, issue with it. There's they, they play so they play long enough sets. Yeah. When you're playing. Fuck it, man. Yeah, they're playing almost three hours. They're playing yeah. two hours and 45 minutes. Yeah, they can do whatever they want. They're, they're going to get your songs in there. And there's there's so many, you know, these songs that they're played like Better and Sorry, I think IRS a couple times, This I Love, Chinese Democracy. And when you plug Slash's solo into it, you know, it it adds a little more to it. It doesn't change it a whole lot. Yeah. You know, I mean, Bumblefoot's a great fucking guitarist. But Slash is kind of like, it's the whole kind of Ace Freely scenario. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, sure, Tommy Thayer is probably is better than Ace Freely, but he sure yeah. as shit doesn't have that sound that, that Ace Freely sounds. Yeah. You know, so it's like Slash, he has that unmistakable tone and sound that like, you know, wasn't there on Chinese Democracy. So whenever you plug that in on the live shows, you know, it makes these songs that much more enjoyable, I yeah. think. Who, who, who... Who was on the Chinese Democracy record? Because, you know... There's like... Bumblefoot's on a lot of it. There's like three different... Buckethead recorded all of it. And then when he left, Axel said, oh, fuck it, and scrapped almost everything, I oh, think. Oh, wow. That's, that's what delayed it another year or something. <laughs> but I think, I think like one... I think I'd read maybe one or two things that Buckethead did. He ended up leaving. But... Almost everything got re-recorded, and then then he had that one dude, Chris Wise, is that right or no? That's know. the dude from Nineties Nose. But fuck, I don't know. That what Tobias guy came in. What for about a bit. Robin Fink? Was he ever yeah, on it, or was he out before they did this? Or that's who I'm thinking of when I said Chris Wise. I was confusing him because that was another Nineties Nose guy. Yeah. But yeah, Fink. Yeah, he he recorded stuff, and I think some of it's on there. But I think the ma- the majority of the stuff is Bumblefoot. Okay, gotcha. But anyway, and then Tommy Stinson's on the whole thing. Yes, and then Frank Ferrar. Ferrar yeah, yeah. Um, which Frank Ferrar's fucking badass live. Yeah, well, I've seen it. I've seen it. You know. Oh yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, it, here's my question. You know, wrapping this up. Do you think they're going to do another album with the lineup they have now? I don't know. Like people keep mentioning that. <clears throat> I don't think they should because it would take, you know, I'm not going to do the stupid Chinese democracy joke about it taking too long, but that's what Axl Rose does. He's like a perfectionist mm-hmm. to where they can't go in and knock something out in nine months like a normal band yeah. or even Metallica, you know, spreads that kind of stuff out, but they're actively doing it. You know, it, I don't, I just don't see it happening. I could see him doing a, maybe a song or something. Yeah. It's but, like if, if they try to do an album that's where it might go in and implode again all yeah. over you know maybe they should just keep this whole touring thing going for a while yeah i don't know yeah because you got to go the writing process and then the recording process this could you know it could just be drug out too long and mm-hmm. <clears throat> i think they're probably just better off going for it you know i saw someone joke about the fact that it would be cool if they just went in and re-recorded chinese democracy as you know the band Mm-hmm. You know, and just how like Slash would play it and Duff and everything, but I don't know if that's even worth the time. Nah, or, I don't think know? so. I think if they did something, it should be new. But I'm kind of like you. I don't really. I'd like to see them just keep doing what they're doing mm-hmm. now. Seems I'm, to be working. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I'd like it, but yeah. I don't. I don't. Kind of like you said, I don't think it should happen because yeah. it might screw stuff up. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, overall, I mean. Every album in a row, it all kind of flows together until you get to Chinese Democracy. But like we said, it's not bad. It's kind of like we talked about. You listen to 
early Metallica and later Metallica, or early Megadeth and later Megadeth, it changes a lot. Yeah. You Chinese know, democracy was kind of like a secret level of a video game. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? There you go. <clears throat> well, we've talked about, we've mentioned we're going to do Pantera, a couple other bands, but I think the next one we're going to do is Ozzy Osbourne's yeah. solo career. I'm starting that tomorrow morning on the way to work. All right. Blizzard of Oz. Yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> I think it's 12 albums. Yeah. I counted. Which I didn't mention. Another thing I wanted to mention about this one was that, you know, we did Megadeth and that was a pretty long haul, 16 albums, and it was 12 hours in about 10 minutes, I think. This Guns N' Roses thing was uh, six hours and like 15 minutes mm-hmm. with six albums. Yeah. So they were like 10 albums less and they were over half the amount of time <laughs> with Megadeth because of songs like Coma and yeah. Estranged and November yeah, exactly. Rain and all this stuff. You know? yeah. Which going way back, that's one thing I wanted to ask you. What do you think about the Don't Cry November Rain Estranged thing? You should listen to those in order and see how they flow. Oh, is that the little is the that the trilogy? Little story? Yeah, but yeah, they I should. The songs well, I don't think were really written as a trilogy. Just the videos were made as a trilogy. Yeah, but anyway. Well, the, vi- the Don't Cry video was just them on top of a building playing with Shannon Hoon. But then it's uh, got the it cuts to those scenes right of him like in the in the graveyard and stuff. Wasn't that Don't Cry where he's all cold in the graveyard? I thought that was November Rain. At the Is end of the November be- Rain. Oh. It's been a while since I've seen either one of them. Now we got to do all the videos. Yeah. That's <laughs> another YouTube. Yeah, that's yeah. another episode. Fuck. Every video in a row. <laughs> That'd be easy to do, though, because we just pull up YouTube. Someone's got a yeah, playlist, exactly. I'm sure. Oh, you know they do. <laughs> well, if you're listening here on YouTube, hit subscribe to us. Go back and check out the previous two. Be on the lookout for the next one. We've also got stuff up. Reaction reviews for Metallica's album. Vince Sevenfold, Black Sabbath. We got a lot of our podcasts up there too. Yeah. Yeah. We put up all the podcasts now. We've got 113 episodes. We've had on guys from Megadeth, those who mentioned, Shine Down, Corrosion of Conformity, Soil, Sons of Texas, Warrant, Death Angel, Overkill, Europe, Bullet Boys, Taiketto, Great White, Drowning Pool, Avatar. The list goes on and on. We're on soundcloud.com backslash thunder dash underground. Or of course, you can find them here on YouTube. Hit us up at thethunderunderground.com on Facebook and everything else. Till next time. Thunder Underground, y'all. <laughs> <laughs>